Welcome, Tanya today. Hi, Rabbi Ronnie Fine, coming to you from Chabad, Zuch and Kedesh, in Montreal, Canada, where it's a privilege and a pleasure to share with you the Tanya. As we share daily with Rusty from Texas, Irma in St. Martin, Eddie is with us in Washington State. We have uh, Simcha in Florida, Mateen in Canada. Denise is in New Jersey, while well, Jenna is with us from, not certain, but welcome, Aliba and Davida, twin sisters, all the way in New York, oh, good morning, we have with us David in beautiful Gold River, California, all right, is that like, like where everybody went west to find the gold, in the Gold River? Carlos is with us. Oops. Diane, I lost the feed here. What's going on? Um, Julia in, in Pennsylvania. Kislagi. Ooh. Yeah, L sounds easier. Welcome. Diane in, in uh, London, Ontario. John is with us in North Carolina. Oh, okay. I think maybe didn't start at the beginning. I think that was the issue. Carlos in Costa Rica, welcome. In uh, Mexico, hello. Sarah is in New York with us. Daphne, South Carolina. Lacey in La uh, Cheyenne River, Lakota. Ooh, all right. And then we have Jesse with us in New Creek, West Virginia. We've got a creek, we got a river. Then we got Rena in Colorado. Ahmed is in Egypt with us. Welcome. Good to see you. Laurie in uh, North Carolina. June in Australia. Good night. <laughs> Peter in Toronto, Canada. All right. My old hometown. Amy, Lagos, Nigeria, welcome. Denise in Israel, in the Holy Land, in Beersheba. Beautiful. Thank you for joining. Lynn is in Long Island with us. Okay. La L in Italia. All right, beautiful. Okay, folks, we have with us on Clubhouse, we have Babacia, Vilma, Liana, David, Marcy, uh, Patrick, Eric, David, Ari, and Mo Mao. I'm, I'm sure I got that wrong. And Instagrammers are back with us. We got an Instagram. Joseph, we have Hello, the tiny Jew. <laughs> Hanan, Richard, Regina, Rachel in South Carolina, Yenta Telebenta in New York, Michael, uh, who else do we have here? Sarah in Montreal. Thank you for joining. We have Sandy in, in Michigan. We have Robert 
and gold is green uk welcome back and zolot in budapest i think okay all over the world everybody beautiful okay we're continuing in the 25th letter today we're coming somewhat full circle we've been going through a very lengthy explanation to understand the distinction between good and evil in the sense not what is good and what is evil in about how does good get its vitality how does holiness get its vitality and how does evil get its vitality it comes from one god as we've explained it comes from the same place but the difference is are you looking face to face at a person or you look away from them face to face inner deeper connection look away kind of external kind of removed is it still from you it's coming from you but not in the same place that's what we learned right now we're learning Torah when you do good you act a holy act extend your hand to to give charity to help somebody to do good to put filling on the arm whatever it is you get vitality you're you're getting life at that moment from God but from the inner dimension from his countenance face to face lovingly truly what he wants when we choose to use the same hand but in a in a ungodly way right are we used to our mouths to speak things that shouldn't be spoken we're also getting vitality we're also getting energy we're also getting it from god that vitality but it's coming from klipa it's coming from the other side it's coming from looking away god's not true inner desire it's external a aspect of his holiness right that's what we learned in just in brief previously now with these words of truth now we can understand our, our original subject about anger that was our original subject as the sages in the Talmud say something very strong very um wow that someone gets angry is like an idolater hmm. why because everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven meaning whatever happened to you and you got angry well it's coming from heaven it's coming from God it's meant for you not only it's meant for you it's good for you not only that God's giving the vitality to that person who is actually saying something nasty to you right now to be able to do that which we'll get more into in a moment the, the, the metaphor for that right so it's all in the hands of heaven except for one thing the fear of heaven what does fear of heaven mean the choice the moral prerogative choice that we have between right and wrong that's not in the hands of heaven the moral choice the moral prerogative that we have that's in our hands everything else not in our hands we can't control it we can respond to it deal with it appropriately but can't control it which was what, what does that mean in other words if you get angry from something that's meant from that is coming from heaven so then you're like an idolater because you're denying God that this is coming from him but if you get angry not for um, but for the fear of him which means heavenly issues in other words you see somebody doing something wrong you're upset by their lack of morality right well we have an example of this Moses Moshe Rabbeinu leader of the Jewish people he got angry at, at Jews right because 
Jews were doing wrong. And he was in a position, obligated, to correct their ways, to bring them off the negative path onto a notorious path. Right? But that obviously only applies to an individual who's able, through their showing of anger, being very upset at the way a person acts, that they can actually change their direction, change their negative behavior, right? If you can't do that, then your anger is pointless and actually might be um, might be um, harmful because you're not going to help that person. You're just going to, I don't know, bring them further away. And there's no point in that. I can bring them closer to doing better. So when you don't do that, then you shouldn't um, get angry. There's no point to it. And this now comes to the 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 topic at specific topic at of hand that the Baal Shem Tov, it was written in 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 Tzavos Arivash in teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, that he said in a situation when a person is praying and an uncircumcised heathen right an idolater right is coming to disrupt you coming to disrupt your prayers like mm, what are you praying to god well, what god who god you know i'm, I'm, I'm just i'll tell Shams didn't say that or the or the alternate, right? They're just coming to talk to you, to confuse you, to um upset you, maybe. So to get upset at that person for their lack of morality will be meaningless. We're talking about a, a you know, a heathen over here. Not interested. And you're in the middle of your prayer, so you know. You're not going to engage that person. So for you to be upset that you're being disrupted in your prayers is being like an idolater in that moment, if you would be, right? So then why is this happening? You know, thinking to yourself, I'm praying. I'm doing good right now. I'm trying to connect to God, and this person's trying to disconnect me from God, Right? Again, this is the metaphor that is being used over here, or the situation, right? So this can only be because God wants us to prevail over ourselves, to pray even more, in greater depth, with more heart, with more intense concentration. Such intense concentration that you don't even hear the heathen talking to you, right? However, to get to such a level of intense concentration to arouse that within us so this is what we need to do we need to arouse that which is from the very subject itself and this is now based on what we've learned now that i'm giving the advice again in a situation where something is disruptive in your life but you can't do anything about it right that's the, 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 the situation. Why would, if you're doing good, why would God send you something to disrupt you from the good that you're doing? You're praying to God and there's this heathen trying to disrupt you, disengage you. So again, it's, owner, it's only in order that we could get deeper into our prayers to such a degree that we don't even hear. We don't even hear this. By the way, this is what happens in synagogue quite often. Forget about a heathen. Sometimes, you know, but so, well, it happens in synagogues, so sometimes you need to reprimand the individual. Right? So that's not the situation over here. Here is, you, there's nothing to reprimand the individual. There's nothing to get them straight because, you know, they're not coming from a, a good place. 
or just, you know, happen to get off the path. So how are you going to get to such a deeper place in your prayers? So the Altenib says, consider and meditate upon the following. About the Shekhinah, the divine presence of God, right? And how it's descended. Remember, the Shekhinah is the word of God that gives vitality, gives its existence to everything. Gives existence to me right now in my prayer. Now, that's me, but look how wondrous it's, it has fallen. The spark of radiance is now of God, of his divine presence, is in Klippa, is in negativity, is in the shell. It's in a, Generally, it's in a state of exile in Klippa. That's the general reality of the world around us. But specifically, in particular, it is this spark of divinity, right? Which is the only source of vitality for me and the heathen in this moment, right? But in the heathen, it's vested now in a state of exile. How? In the speech of this heathen, that who is uttering words to disrupt my divine service, my devout concentration during prayer. And as we learn that God creates a, one, op, one thing opposite to the other. In other words, it's the holy side. God's animating me right now in my prayer. That's the holy side. But there's a counterpart to it. And that's now, in the heathen, the other side. Sitracher. That the spernal speech of God itself is now in this lowly speech of the heathen. In a way that it is so much uh, reduced that light of God, that spark that animates, that is now that life force is in exile, in klipa, and negativity. And indeed, this is what we learned previously, that sacred man is ruled by, <clears throat> uh, by evil man, right? So you have sacred man, man in prayer, with um, evil man. And the evil man is ruling over, but it's to his detriment. What's to the detriment over here? <laughs> because the evil man, right, this heathen who is trying to disrupt you, this person in prayer, right, what happens because of that? It's to his detriment, right? Evil is always trying to cling to good in order to nurture and get, you know, more life from there to holiness. But it's to his detriment. Why? Because what happens to holy man, sacred man? He recognizes, hey, that spark of Shekhinah is in there only to arouse me to a deeper place in my prayer that I don't even hear your talk, your babble, that I should meditate more deeply and have a greater devotion in my prayer as a result to such a degree that I don't even hear. Or sacred man doesn't hear the evil man, the heathen, and his words that are trying to be disruptive. So that's the meditation, the thought, the alternative says that we should entertain that will give, you know, the person in their prayers the power to more deeply engage in prayer when the negative force in front of the heathen, who's got the Shekhinah's there, vested came to such a low place to give vitality to this individual, to use their words, their speech, and the divine speech vested in that person. What? Just to disrupt me? Just to bring me back to the same place? No. Not to bring me back to the same place. To bring me to a higher place. To a greater so unbelievable that disruption in my life so of course this is the metaphor the balshemtiv is using right but we can use it in so many different instances right my boss is coming down on me not in an appropriate way a loved one is coming down on me now of course if you to be upset at their lack of morality that we can 
only if we can help them in their moral choice. But often we can't. And that's why the extreme, you know, example of the uncircumcised heathen, right, who is trying to just disrupt you in your prayers, that's the... Um, The, the metaphor um, you know that's a very unlikely situation in our lives a situation in our lives would be more likely you know someone that we know someone that we care for someone we love is you know said something so sometimes there's they need to be rebuked because of what they did that's wrong we have to be careful. Am I rebuking them because I'm hurt? Or am I rebuking them for their benefit? So Moses rebuked only for the benefit of the Jew, not, you know, because I'm, ups, you know, you hurt me in some way. If it's you hurt me some way, then it's about me not recognizing this came from God. Recognize that it came from God. It was meant for you. So that will allow you to dig deeper in you. In this instance, is that you can pray more deeply. In other instances, it might be that you will um, take the message on some level, you know, or you will um, be able to still see good in a loved one after they've hurt you, right? Or having compassion on them. Look how. The Shekhinah has come so low and is in exile on them. What a pity. And you have compassion on them. I'm just giving some other examples of more likely scenarios in our lives. But the point is, is that it's going to bring us to a greater place, not, a, not bring us down into anger or even being upset or frustrated. This is a powerful idea to incorporate in our lives, of course. Now the Alter Rebbe continues and says, and he brings it, remember that Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, born in 7, 1698, passed away in 1760, if I remember. A long time ago. Look how his teachings are forever re relevant. His teachings he spoke in Yiddish, and the compiler of the book, Tzavasa Rivash, um, translated or took his words and put it into Hebrew. And because of that, there was a, a, a mistranslation. And this is where the whole issue came up that people were. Uh, flabbergasted with the teachings, how could you say that the Shechina, the divine presence of God, is Sharsa. Sharsa means dwelt. Dwelt means um, openly revealed in the heathen who is, you know, trying to confuse the, the Jew who's praying. How could you say that? So the Altered explains, because he spoke in Yiddish and it was translated into Hebrew, um, it was uh, the compiler didn't give the precise terminology because really what it, he should have written in Hebrew is Nislabsha, that the Shrina is enclosed in the heathen, not Sharsa, which means um, revealed in the heathen. And the heathen who is trying to uh, be evil or is acting evil, the, you know, the divine presence is not revealed. In someone who's praying or learning Torah, the divine presence is revealed, right? So he should have used the term nislavsha, which implies vested in a way that is, like, you know, can can be concealing um, that the shechina is there in a state of exile, invested in the heathen, right? That would have been the appropriate. That would have been right. But the concept still remains the same concept, that it is the spark of the Shechina that is within the heathen, that's giving the vitality to the heathen to say things that are 
of a, of a nature of klipa, right? Ah, uh, how could you say that? How could you refer the Shechina, the divine presence of God, is an um, is a spark of radiance that is in the this evil doer, right? This this heathen. So that's not a problem because we see that created e- angels are sometimes referred to God as in God's name. The word in uh, in God's name. We see that um, that Avram of you know, Abraham actually caught in a couple of weeks. And he says to the angels, the three angels that came to him, refer to them as uh, in, in, in God's name, Adai Shem, Lord, don't pass by your servant. Uh, likewise, we see by Hagar uh, that she uh, called the name of God who spoke to her, and it was an angel that spoke to her, but yet it was. Uh, using God's name, so uh, it's a created angel. It's not God. So we see sometimes that we, that, that can be, you know, uh, used in such a reference. The same thing is the Shekhinah, you know, is in the uh, in the heathen who's acting in an evil way. It, it's there, but it doesn't mean revealed. The spark is there, hidden within the uh, individual, and we can still call it Shekhinah. With that, we conclude today's class. More actually, we'll conclude the entirety of this letter. Amazing, beautiful, powerful. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? Galice, I was uh, I tend to sit away when gathered. Is this if you're distracted and you need to remove yourself somewhat? I'm not I'm not exactly clear what the context is, but you know, if it's helping you, then yes, it should be okay. So uh Lori, sometimes I'm praying and my own thoughts interrupt me. Or I find it difficult to focus. Is this similar? Not at all. Well, it, 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 yes and no. You know. Um, yes and no. Good question, Laurie. Our own thoughts. I have it all the time. Now, of course, you know, it, it, I mean, in a certain way, it is the same thing. It is the negative nature within me that's trying to derail me from the good that I'm doing, right? The animal soul that's fighting against the godly soul. The godly soul wants to connect. It wants to do good. That's what it is. It is good. So, um, and it's getting its vitality from Klippa. So in that sense, yes, when we recognize that that's what it is, <laughs> the neg- a negative source of Klippa, um, so that will give us the strength to overcome. So when we have that disruption within ourselves, we don't need someone on the outside, which is very true, Laurie. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, we recognize the only reason I'm having that disruption from within is in order that I can dig deeper within me to pray even more deeply and more profoundly, more connective. When we recognize that, then that gives us the power that we can do that. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. Beautiful. Karen, today is your father's 41st yard site. Actually, for some reason, I thought it was tomorrow. The third. I'm guessing maybe I'm wrong. Hold on. Karen. So we'll dedicate it, the learning today. Jacob ben Shlomo. Right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You're correct. I made a mistake. Yeah, your site is today. I have that written here too. For some reason, I thought it was uh, tomorrow. So we dedicate to Karen, her father. Um, Karen was a devoted Tanya learner. <laughs> um, today's learning to her father's neshama. This is your site today, 41st your site. Should have an aliyah and uh, should. Um, 
May it be the better for you and for all of us. Okay, thank you. Um, Carlos is asking a good question. Did not Pinchas get angry when he acted? Yes, but he was acting, he was angry at the moral choice that they made and how that was affecting actually the Jewish people because, uh, you know, there was a plague that ensued as a result. So he killed uh, Zimri Solo in, in order to stop the plague, which indeed happened. And God was very happy with that. So his anger wasn't that, oh, you did something to me and I'm going to get, you know, I'm angry at you. No, he did something that is immoral, you know, illicit relations in public. And, um, and moreover, not just not just that, but the consequence of that was also ensuing plague because of others that were involved uh, also not uh, appropriately um, that was bringing death to the Jewish camp. So yes, he got angry, and rightfully so. As we mentioned, there are times that you have to get angry, right? Someone acts with anti-Semitism before you and, oh, this is from God, let me accept it. Yes, whatever you need to accept, you need to accept. But for that act of immorality, there's a sense of anger. Now, I was just angry because, you know, oh, I hate these anti-Semites. And again, you get angry, I get so angry at anti-Semites. There, there's really no place for that because the anger is only uh, um, to do something about it just to display anger so you display your maybe your self-righteousness is not it, it's got to be in a, in, a, in a an expression of it at least i mean the fact that it's upsetting yes uh, and uh, but the anger is because you're trying to correct something right davida if we act with anger uh if we react with anger. With anger, do we stain our garments and are liable? Yes, absolutely. So on Instagram, we have a question from Natalie. Sure, I'll send you the link. Oh, here's a question. Oh, okay. So we just spoke about anti-Semitism, and that's her question. Uh, how fighting anti-Semitism on this subject? Um, so again, to be full of anger, you know, fighting is... is um, I don't know if, you know... I mean... I'm not certain. The, the, the anger is, you know, we got to be careful with anger in, you know, justifiable, you know, times. Got to be careful with it. And, you know, I'm going to deal more with it than TRC, maybe. I think so. Um, but Natalie, good question. It's a it's a TRC question, more specifically. Would anger be appropriate if it is expressed to prevent the fellow Jew from violating? Yes, one of the prohibitions. Again, only if you, your anger would actually do something about that. If it's just anger that, because you did evil, and it's not going to change anything in that person. If anything, maybe they're just going to, hey, what's your problem? You know, and they're like, like the heathen, right? So then that display of anger, where is it going? What's it doing? Nothing. Sometimes we've got to be careful. It could be just self-righteousness. God created an angel. Wouldn't it be God as he creates it? No, wouldn't be. Robert, don't forget two question marks before you ask the question. Our holy teachers, the rabbis, teach us 
to be a saint, but what it means to be a saint? To be a saint? No, you know, we're not. We're not. We're not saints. To be good Jews, or Jews, and good, you know, do Torah and mitzvahs. How can God express Himself in in a negative way if God actually expressing Himself in a positive way that is hidden? Well, that's one of the issues over here that's a lot of discussion. As how could it be that God would be in such an unholy place? Why, how would he allow such a thing? Why would such a thing be? How could it be? That's a very good question. And, but the fact is, it remains that that is the fact. Why and how and so on and so forth. Is we dealt a little bit about it. And the author had actually said that. He asked the same question. How could it be that the Shekhinah, the divine presence of God, be in exile, being in Klippa? So that's an extensive discussion. But the fact is, it is that way. You know, how could it be? How does it happen? And so on. The fact is, it is. Yeah. Uh, John, would anger be appropriate? It is the express infer- Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I saw that again. Okay. Excellent questions. Great discussion over here. So, uh, Natalie, yeah. Um, just have to be careful that it's not just about self-righteousness. Often our anger is in self-righteousness. Anger is here to correct a immoral situation. So the anti-Semite is right in front of you acting as an anti-Semite. So sometimes the anger is important, right? Whether it's going to teach them a lesson or not may not be but it might teach others around you a lesson. Anyway, there's more discussion on it. Good, good questions. Great conversation. Okay, folks. TRC Tanya Rabbi Community. I think you want to try it for those who haven't. All right. I'm Rabbi Ronnie Fine coming to you from Chabad Zuchin Kedeshim in Montreal, Canada. It's a privilege and a pleasure to share with you. Tanya Rambam's coming up in a few minutes. Come join us. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, folks.